Thanks everybody for joining us. My name is Sydney Peasley. I'm at the Greater Des Moines Partnership and I am the project manager in talent development who's running the Seize the City program for this summer. So thanks all for joining us. This is our second session. We kicked off two weeks ago with Danny Beyer talking about virtual networking. Today we've got Ryan Anderson on to talk to us about LinkedIn. So I'll let him go ahead and introduce himself and share his screen. I think he's got some slides for us and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, if anybody has any questions throughout um, Ryan's indicated he's open to um, people just chiming in with those. Feel free to send them to me in the chat or to Ryan um, at the beginning or the end. We're pretty casual here. So. Perfect. Well, thanks again, Sydney, for the introduction and the opportunity to talk to um, some of the interns uh, around the city. So um, just a few, just kind of quick background on myself. So I am a professor at Grandview University in the business department. I teach primarily finance and management courses over at Grandview. And then uh, on the side, um, I do career coaching, career consulting. So LinkedIn and sort of digital networking is, is definitely my wheelhouse. Um, and so Cindy and I had a good conversation and we just thought, hey, it might be beneficial to cover, especially during a pandemic, right? Uh, like we're all surviving right now. Uh, might be good to talk about how do you connect with people when you can't easily or as comfortably meet face to face, which is the standard mode for, for connecting with people. LinkedIn is a very powerful uh, modality uh, tool to uh, connect with people. So um, I'm gonna pop up the PowerPoint here in a second. Um, the first group of slides is just general sort of bet thoughts on networking. Um, that's just a few minutes. But the chunk, the meat of this, of this topic uh, today is LinkedIn. How to, how to maximize your LinkedIn profile in order to connect with people um, when you can't go grab coffee or a drink or dinner, um, you know, face to face uh, in a super comfortable environment. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Um, it should be up now. And if you can't see it again, feel free to chime in. As Sydney alluded to, this is super casual. Feel free to interject if you have questions, either let Sydney know in the chat or uh, just unmute yourself and ask. Um, pretty casual. So. So let's get into it, LinkedIn. Uh, so again, we're gonna talk about what is networking, uh, a little bit about where to start. Um, networking is not just for extroverts. That's one of the clear misconceptions I wanna just get rid of and throw out the window right away. You can be an introvert and actually make some good, awesome relationships with folks. Uh, and then a little bit about informational interviews, cause that's a really important part of the online connection uh, process. And then we'll talk specifically about LinkedIn and some of the, the pros and cons. So of course, networking at its base level, it's about relationships, connecting with people. Um, there's this thing called heuristics. I don't know if you guys learned about this in, in your classes or just in general. Heuristics is, are, they're like cognitive shortcuts that we use to get to know people. So let me give you an example. I work at Grandview um, and let's say I'm at Hy-Vee and I'm walking, you know, I'm shopping and I see a, a Grandview t-shirt on or a Grandview hat on. I automatically know there's something in common uh, that I have with that person. I can go and say, hey, did you go to Grandview? Do you work there? We have something to bond over that can quicken. That's what heuristics is. It's a, a cognitive shortcut that quickens our get to know you time. And, and that's, again, something that's a little harder to do uh, digitally, but we can still do it, especially with tools like Zoom, Skype, and the like. We can use heuristics still to look at nonverbal cues, still, still to find out about somebody. Um, and think about it as, as finding commonalities. That's what really heuristics is about, finding things you have in common and building off of that. Um, you know, do you like to golf? Do you like to read? You know, find things you have in common with people. The bottom line is we use heuristics dozens of times a day. We just aren't aware of it. It's a very subconscious process. Um, and don't get me wrong, you know, some resistance to networking is natural. It's not, sometimes it feels feigned, feels a little, I don't know, inauthentic, I think is a good word. Um, but again, it's, it's important. And, and again, I just want to make clear, it's not just for extroverts and it doesn't have to be planned. That's the other misconception is that it has to be this big formal drawn out process. You can connect with your neighbors six feet away now, I guess, but you know, uh, but you can connect with your neighbors, uh, people that, you know, you, you see, um, if you're on a, if you do extracurricular stuff outside of work, um, you can connect with people, um, in a variety of ways. And again, it's not a nuisance. Um, you know, the, the biggest thing is people like to talk about themselves. So when in doubt, ask people about what, the, what they enjoy doing. One thing I will share with you is a lot of people, um, when they make small talk, just a quick tip, they tend to go down the route of like, well, tell me, about, tell me about what you do for work or tell me about what you do for a job or, 
you know, and I'll be honest, a lot of folks don't necessarily always enjoy their job, you know, so you might want to be a little leery about using that as the, the first question. Ask them about their hobbies and their interests. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's something I learned a long time ago that I, I try to do is until you get to know somebody, say, hey, what do you enjoy doing outside of work? You know, do you, what do you enjoy? Um, everyone's got a hobby or an interest, right? Um, so again, where do you start? Well, start, if you're in college, start with, you know, um, your, you know, colleagues, your students that are around you, um, teammates, if you're on a sports team, um, if you're in like, a, you know, a, like a online or excuse me, a, a campus group, for example, those are great places to meet people. Um, and, and so you want to start with what we call your natural network, right? The people that are, and that includes your friends and family. That's where you start. And now that you're interning, you're working somewhere, you're, you know, you're meeting more people, like even in this cohort, there's what, 10 other people, give or take on here. Those are all people you should be connecting with. And again, um, staying in touch with once this program is done. Um, all right. So let's talk about if you do fall on that introvert side of the scale, let's just talk about that for a brief second. Try to drop the word networking. Think of it more as gathering information and building a relationship. Try to think more long-term about it. I will tell you candidly that every single job I've gotten, except for my very first one I've gotten because of somebody I knew, not because of how great my resume was. Now listen, you gotta have a good resume too. I'm not trying to uh, be pejorative. You have to have a good resume, but you also have to know people to get your foot in the door. Um, and introverts can rely on the written word email, uh, you know, direct message, uh, you know, on, on social media, rely on the written word. If it's more comfortable, start that way, right? Uh, LinkedIn's perfect for that. And again, we're just a couple sides away from getting more into that. Um, try to join a professional association or at least attend some meetings. Um, there's a lot of young professional groups around Des Moines. Um, I'm sure they've moved virtually, at least I'm guessing most of them have. Um, but that's a great way to, if you're gonna, you know, stick around Des Moines, which you should, get to know some people, um, you know, uh, you know, professionals connection. Um, I mean, there's, there's tons of YP groups, uh, around town, um, but try to try to join a group. Um, and again, um, that's just, just a few basic tips. So the other thing I want you to consider when looking at networking is considering it more informational interviews. So let's say there's a, there's a company that you really, really, really want to work for. This is where LinkedIn is powerful. What you want to do is look for second tier connections, and I'll explain more what that means in a few minutes. But you want to look for second tier connections that work at that prospective uh, employ, employer um, and reach out to them and ask for an informational interview um, via Zoom or whatever they're comfortable with. Um, and some of the reasons you might want to, to reach out to them are just simply to explore um, you know, careers, clarify career goals, um, ask about employment opportunities at that, that company. Um, actually, gets, look at it as a good beta or a test run for a job interview. Informational interviews are a great low stakes way of making a good impression on someone that might be your manager someday or could help you get a job someday. Um, and uh, there's two, I, I, one of the biggest things from the slide that's important, I wanna put an exclamation point behind is how important, uh, there's two different types of informational interviews. There's ones that are very ta tactical, which means you're, you're, ac you're asking specifically about the person's department, the person's job, the day in and day out, you know, stuff. And then there's more high level. Th that's more of the, the mentoring side, if you will. I call those mentor inter interviews. Um, and those are more like high level, like, hey, could you look over my resume for me and tell me if it looks good? Could you make a specific connection at this company for me? Um, those are more high level. Um, whereas the information ones are a little bit more on the ground and more tactical, um, but they're both valuable. Um, so again, uh, this font's a little small, so I apologize, but, but the bottom line here is that you need to a, identify where you want to be, assess your own sort of skill sets as opposed to what they're looking for, right? In the job post, or the job description, prepare for the interview by reaching out ahead of time and looking at Glassdoor or Indeed for company reviews, that, I cannot stress that enough. Um, use Glassdoor and Indeed to get a sense of what the company culture is like. One of my favorite sayings, folks, is, uh, is culture eats strategy for launch. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, I don't care how great the strategy of the company is, if they don't have a, hump, uh, a healthy comp uh, company culture, organizational culture, um, it, it, you know, you're gonna be, you're probably not gonna be happy to be blunt. And, and another way of looking at that is if your personal values, your ethos don't align with the company's values and, and 
culture and they're not congruent, you're also probably, frankly, not going to have, uh, you're not going to be professionally um, satisfied, in my experience, working with literally hundreds of folks over the last seven, eight years. Um, so it's really important that you do the due diligence and the research about the company on the front end, right? Prior to the interview. Um, again, and so that's just, you know, the other thing is, and it sounds obvious, but dress appropriately. Uh, know what the culture dictates in terms of dress code and then act and then act as if, right? You want to, you want to, you know, if it's a most white collar environments want you to wear, you know, suit and tie or business professional dress, regardless of um, the, the opening. There are occasions when if it's a, you know, more of a, a blue collar job, they might say it's okay to wear jeans and a polo, but you really want to be careful. I, I, I generally would rather you prepare to be overdressed than underdressed. I just think is a, is a better etiquette, uh, you know, rule. And then just a couple of last things on networking real quick. So follow up is half the battle. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, you know, I actually had one of my best accounting students a couple of years ago, best accounting students, really wanted a job at Ernst & Young, one of the big four accounting firms, really, really wanted. So I brought in one of my friends to speak to the class who happened at the time to work at EY. And he sent him a follow-up note, which is fantastic, except he made one small but glaring mistake. He, he spelled it Ernest & Young, like the name Ernest. And you're thinking, who cares? It's like one or two letters, you know, Ernst, Ernest. Uh, but believe it or not, that solo mistake, that little thing was enough to have my buddy say, if he can't even get the name right, how, what's his attention to detail look like, right? As a prospective, you know, employee, that was enough to, to not get him an interview. As, as crazy as it sounds. So, so when you follow up, please, please, please read the email a couple times over, proofread it. Um, make sure you do it within 24 to 36 hours. Don't wait too long for that follow-up email. Um, occasionally, a handwritten is nice uh, just because we're so inundated with emails. But I have to be honest, if it's specific to a job opening or something that's time sensitive, you may not have the time luxury or the luxury time-wise of sending a handwritten note. Um, so you really have to know if you have, if you have four or five days, sometimes it's a nice touch. But I still think email is the fastest and more standard way um, to send that follow-up thank you um, to whoever you had the informational interview with. Um, Ryan, I've got a question yeah. before you keep going, if that's okay. Yeah, go. Um, you were talking about culture, and so I've got a question here regarding if you have any recommendations of questions to ask to get a good feel for company culture, um, rather than just having a hiring manager or a recruiter or whatever, say whatever sounds nice. Great question. That is a fantastic question. So yeah, when you go into the interview environment, whether it's an informational interview or specifically a formal interview, there, I always have tell folks to have two to three questions in their back pocket ready because inevitably you're going to hit that juncture in the interview where they say, what questions do you have for us? So you have to be prepared. Um, three questions or two questions to suss that out. Um, tell me about the day in the life of this position. That question is fantastic because it really gets to the heart and soul. What does the day look like here? Right. Um, and you can glean a lot from the reaction. Right. Uh, and, and, and then that's one question to help um, kind of get a, the idea of a corporate culture. The second one is, um, you know, how long have you worked here and, and, and why? Uh, and this may sound a little direct, but just bear with me and I'll explain it in a second. Um, how long um, have you happened to work at XYZ company and what are the things you enjoy most about this job? A, it's a positive spin, but what you're trying to do is figure out what's kept them around. Uh, I like to get an idea of the tenure of the people that are interviewing me because that's a pretty big, bold sign about the how healthy or unhealthy the culture is. If I interview with five people and four of them are new within the last six months, that should maybe, that might be a red flag. Like, why is there so much turnover? If I interview with five people and they've all been there five, 10, 20 years, well, heck, I want to be part of this thing. So those two questions can help suss out. Again, asking about like, what, what do you enjoy about this job? Um, how long have you been here? And then tell me about the, like a day in the life of this position, this role. Um, and then also um, ask about what are some of the things they do? Um, do they ask if they do things outside, like as a department outside of work? Um, because what I found is, I'll give you an example. My first job out of school was uh, at Standard & Poor's, a big mutual fund company. And every, in the summer, every Friday, we would, we would work um, a shortened schedule. We'd work four or nine hour days and like a five hour day, I believe on Fridays. And then we'd go out for a later lunch together and have a couple of beers. 
Um, I can tell you that was one of my best jobs, partly because we just bonded over those Friday afternoons for an hour or two. Um, now, not every environment is going to have that. Please don't think that that's always the norm, but I'm just saying you want to know if they occasionally go out and hang out together, right? I think that's not an inappropriate thing to ask, um, you know, and you can, you can glean a lot from the reaction to those kind of questions. So I, does that answer uh, the question? I've got one more. Go. Um, about introverts networking online or virtually. And typically when you're meeting with somebody face to face, there's a lot of small talk that happens. Is that something that you recommend if you're going to message somebody via LinkedIn or a social media platform, or do you just kind of skip it and make it a little more direct? Well, that's a really good question. I'll be honest. I get more direct, <laughs> you know, via written word. Um, and I'm pretty succinct, you know, I think that's appreciated. Um, uh, it, you know, like when people, when salespeople uh, reach out to me for whatever reason, you know, there tends to be this long drawn out like, hey, how are you? What's, you know, what's new? When, you know, let's be honest, we all have pretty strong intuition. Generally, they want to sell me or you someone, something, right? Um, so I prefer just to get kind of down to brass tacks a little bit and, and don't be, you know, uh, be tactful, right? But, but just be candid. Just say, hey, the reason I'm reaching out to you is because I see you work at this company and I would love to learn, set up a, a virtual coffee or in-person coffee, whatever you're comfortable with, uh, learning more about your department or that company. Just, just say, say what your goal is. I think that, because then that will put the ball in their court, you know, as to how they re respond um, instead of wasting valuable time. Uh, one of my favorite books, by the way, that actually gets into that is Networking for People Who Hate Networking, <laughs> A Field Guide for Introverts. Uh, it, I, I am an extrovert, but that book for my friends that are introverts are, is a fantastic book. And uh, the other one is uh, Dig Your Well Before You're Thirsty. Uh, some of these books have been around a little while, but, but here's just a few books I recommend if you're into reading um, to kind of think or generate some thoughts on networking um, in general. Again, real quick recap before we get into LinkedIn, uh, be prepared. Networking can happen anytime, anywhere. It can be casual, it can be formal. Um, you know, have the long game in mind. Don't think you're going to, if you're in a sales role or going to be in a sales role, don't think that sales is going to happen the first time you meet somebody or maybe even the second time um, or whatever your intended purpose is. It doesn't just have to be sales. Be brief, be sincere, and be thankful. I just, I mean, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Um, and, and get involved. Again, try to find professional groups or if, if it's a big enough organization that you're interning at, they might even have other, other groups like affinity groups or other organizational groups. Uh, you know, look, look into those as well. So let's get into digital networking a little more specifically here. So there's a few things that this allows you to do. Tap into the hidden job market, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, have an edge on the competition. Um, gain visibility for future opportunities. Uh, gain referrals, um, which is really important, and uh, and also, um, generally speaking, the relationship's pretty, the correlation is pretty high. The stronger your network, the shorter the job search. Uh, a lot of research has gone into that that proves time and time again, the bigger your network, um, the more connected you are, the most like more faster you are to a land a job. Um, so let's talk about the advantages of LinkedIn. All right. So first off, it's literally a social networking, and most of you are probably familiar with LinkedIn but it's designed specifically for, for professionals. Um, it's used properly. If it's used properly, it can help you find jobs and help up, uptick your uh, networking strength. And it's not just for a job seeker. It's a great way to keep current on, on trends or news. Um, business changes every week. I mean, the business community is always advancing. There's innovation. LinkedIn's a great source for keeping a, a tab on that. Um, here are a few myths I want to get rid of real quick about LinkedIn. A, again, it's not just for people looking for jobs. The best time to create a profile is when you need to find a job. That's absolutely the opposite of, of what's accurate. You need to have a good LinkedIn profile before, again, being on the job search, and that you don't need to network. Those are all uh, three things I wanted to spell. So the overview, um, this is actually outdated. It says over 450 million. I think there's almost twice that now. I mean, there are millions of people on LinkedIn in over 200 countries. This is not just a US centric, you know, um, social media platform. Um, all Fortune 500 companies have multiple representatives and company profiles on LinkedIn. 80% um, of people that are of companies uh, that are on there are looking for people. So, Headhunters, recruiters use LinkedIn 
as one big tool to find uh, talents for talent development purposes. 94% um, of recruiters use LinkedIn. 80% um, of people on LinkedIn are using it as their 1A or 1B for finding talent. So that means they're on LinkedIn all the time looking for, for, uh, for good young talent. Um, so again, um, what, here, the other thing I wanna tell you is once you, once you, main, you get your profile maintained, you, you can't just leave it stagnant. You do need it to update it uh, you know, as things progress in your career. And you also need to make sure you're checking it probably every few days. It's not something just to set it and forget about it. Um, so if, just a few general tips. Uh, you have to have a relevant tagline, which I'm gonna talk about more in a second. You need to make sure that your uh, most recent employers are clearly listed with uh, the job protocols that you've been doing. Um, you need to also make sure that um, you inc incorporate your LinkedIn URL into your resume. Um, well, I noticed more and more people are doing that. So in the past, it was just, you know, your address, your email, maybe your phone number on the top of your resume. You want to include your LinkedIn uh, URL as well in that uh, contact information. Um, this is a really important data point. Users with complete profiles are 40 times more likely to receive job opportunities than those that don't. So having a half complete LinkedIn profile is almost as bad as having no LinkedIn profile. So the completeness or the all-star rating, so to speak, of your LinkedIn profile, it will directly drive how much traffic you get. So again, um, you know, think of LinkedIn as your um, digital uh, living organic version of your resume, right? Um, and so um, first off, let's talk about the profile strength. Again, the more skills, recommendations, and, um, and expertise that you can get built into your profile, the better the strength. And um, the way it works, and this is a good quick graphic for this. So let's say you know you have your first level connection will be coworker Julie, Mark Boss, and then maybe a previous professor, uh, Solid. Well, of course, they're gonna have all their second tier connections, right? And so the more people that you follow in LinkedIn, the better LinkedIn's algorithms get at connecting with you. And there's a couple magic numbers baked into LinkedIn's algorithms. When you connect with 100 people and when you connect with 500. Now, I know that sounds like a lot for some of you, but 100 people actually isn't as many as you think. Um, so once you get to 100 connections, LinkedIn gets way better about um, being able to synthesize who you should connect with. And then LinkedIn makes recommendations. You should connect with this person, you know? So the more people that you can connect with through that, the second level, the better LinkedIn gets at making recommendations uh, for you. The other thing is some of the key features. Um, you should at least like 10 groups or companies, at a minimum 10 companies or groups. So what do I mean by that? If you wanna work for principal financial group, you better be following them on LinkedIn. If you want it for nationwide, follow their, their company page. Uh, if you are an accounting intern, again, I'll just go that, that example. Find, uh, find accounting professionals of Iowa um, or uh, accounting professionals of the Midwest or accounting interns. You know, there are so many uh, professionally oriented uh, groups on LinkedIn. And the more groups you are a part of, the better, again, LinkedIn gets at making recommendations for you. And it makes a recruiter's job easier to find you as well. It's also good to um, get people to um, endorse you. That's the term endorsements on LinkedIn. There's an endorsements section. And the more um, peers from college or professors that can say, hey, Joe is, or Sally is really great at Excel or PowerPoint or uh, you know, whatever skill set, um, the better and it, the better um, it helps your, your overall score. Um, there's a direct job postings uh, on LinkedIn. So it's not just a, it's a push and a pull mechanism. Recruiters will find you directly, but you can also find job postings as well directly. Um, and that's a pretty powerful thing. Again, um, you even see here, it says groups you may like. They'll give you some good recommendations based on what you've plugged into your profile. Um, look for local chamber of commerces. Those are a great way, uh, you know, follow the partnership um, page. You know, they put out a ton of information. Um, these are all good things to try to, to join on LinkedIn to increase your, um, your network. 
And then of course, the nice thing too about LinkedIn is it has an email function, a direct message function. So that's how you, re you reach out on the informational front. So for those interview, I can't talk today. <laughs> those informational interviews, uh, you, you wanna go into the inbox function and then send the message. Understand it is private. You know, when you use the inbox function in LinkedIn, um, only the person you send it to can see it, right? Um, so there is some level of, you know, privacy, so to speak, uh, there. Um, again, follow, in terms of companies, follow the companies that you want to work for or have an interest in. Um, it's a great way to research what they're all about, um, in addition to Glassdoor and Indeed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, find out what positions are open um, and try to keep current on, on job openings. And then kind of a couple other tips here. Recommendations are, are important. Um, I like to see most of my college students get two to three recommendations at least on their profile. It can be, for, again, from a professor or a teammate or just some a classmate, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, somebody you worked with, now that you're interning, right, go ahead and if you've had a good internship experience, you know, after you're done, um, have your supervisor, if you're willing to, have them reach out and say, hey, would you mind leaving me a recommendation on my LinkedIn profile? I, I would strongly encourage if you have a good relationship with your supervisor um, to ask for their endorsement and a recommendation. Um, and then return the favor. Um, if you have, you know, you develop some friendships in this cohort, right, or at work, so to speak, um, as an intern, at, you know, return the favor. Uh, feel free to be proactive and uh, recommend folks. Um, that's, that's a really important thing. And here are just some final thoughts. Um, again, there are three different types of industry groups, as I mentioned earlier. Like for me, I'm part of Financial Executives International. Uh, I'm part of their LinkedIn page. There's also geographically based groups, like again, Young Professionals of Des Moines, uh, Ankeny Young Professionals, Des Moines JCs, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's job title groups. So based on your, your niche, marketing, accounting, finance, uh, business analytics, you know, uh, whatever the course may be. Uh, you have to have mission critical, you have to have a good professional summary at the top of your LinkedIn profile. That's like four to five sentences that is kind of, I call it your 30,000 foot overview, giving a background on, on, on what your skill sets are. You have to have that because LinkedIn's algorithms only go so far deep in your profile sometimes. And so they'll look for those keywords within the, the profile section. Um, your profile picture, okay, I cannot stress this enough. It has to be fairly recent, as in like the last year or so or two. I see some folks that have what I call stale dated pictures from like six, eight years ago. And I'll have to be honest, it, I get a chuckle when I go into a coffee shop to meet with somebody and I've looked at their LinkedIn profile to get an idea what they look for. And I'm looking around, I'm like, holy crap, where did they? Where are they? And they're like, hey, are you Ryan? I'm like, oh man, you do not look like what you did six, eight years ago. Again, I say that tongue in cheek, but you got to update your profile pic. It's got to be accurate. Uh, you don't have to pay anyone to do any glamour shots or, uh, you know, professional shots, but just have a, you know, have a family or friend or whatever, uh, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, uh, take a, a shoulder up picture, right? Um, against a neutral backdrop that's recent, you know, that looks professional. 21 times more likely to be viewed if you have a picture. So you really have to have one. Um, and again, there's over, there's almost 4 million company pages now. Uh, you know, you got a wide breadth to pick from. Go, go find at least 10 and, uh, and connect with them. Uh, two other quick tips I didn't bother to put in the PowerPoint, but I want to I wanna, um, just make clear. So LinkedIn, when you create a LinkedIn profile, they automatically assign you random alphanumeric characters. So like it might be, for example, my original one might have been linkedin.com backslash Ryan Anderson, AB125XX, like just random alphanumeric characters. That actually makes you harder to find. And there's actually a way you can update within LinkedIn. There's actually a function under settings where it says edit profile URL. If you click on the edit profile URL, you can actually create a professional tag for yourself. So for example, if you go to my, my LinkedIn profile, um, it'll say Ryan Anderson PhD. So linkedin.com backslash Ryan Anderson PhD. So you could be, um, you know, Jane Doe accounting intern or, or whatever, or, you know, or, um, or once you get past internship, Jane Doe accounting professional, you know, first, last name. So again, that's one nice way to make yourself more findable. 
And then quickly, the last tip I'll tell you is under settings, if you scroll down to the bottom and click on settings, it'll, it'll, there's two options to make yourselves more viewable for recruiters, okay? Um, it's one that says, uh, I am looking for a job uh, and, and make my, and, and uh, alert recruiters that I am looking for a job. So there's actually two toggle buttons that you can click. Um, now, some people don't feel comfortable doing that, and that's fine, but I'm just saying, if you really want to maximize your uh, LinkedIn visibility, make sure you hit your toggle buttons to yes um, under the security setting um, to make yourself noticed, I should say, by um, headhunters. Um, all right, I just, uh, that's a lot I think I threw at you in 30 minutes. Um, any, any questions or thoughts? I've got one um, yeah. in that you tossed out some things of recommendations of things that people do, but do you have tips of things that you don't like to see? Well, yeah, again, the headshot's a big one, right? Making sure they're up to date, but um, there's, there's a few other things. So let's, uh, with the professional experience, um, a lot of times I see that people just put uh, the company they work at in the date. You actually need to put uh, a few bullet points underneath that. Um, it's too vague. Um, if you just say I worked at Nationwide for six months as an intern, you should actually take three or four bullet points on what you're actually doing and put it in below the, the Nationwide entry. Um, I see that all the time. So uh, the other thing too is um, volunteer experience. Uh, I forgot to cover this, but I see a lot of the people that do great volunteer stuff, but they don't bother to include it in LinkedIn. Make sure if you volunteer at a nonprofit, church, whatever, uh, make sure you include that uh, generally in your, um, your profile. Um, the other thing I would say to do in terms of uh, things to be careful about is uh, make sure that there's no typos. I know that sounds so obvious, but again, I, you'd be shocked at how many typos or misspellings I see um, in a LinkedIn profile. So, so again, ha have somebody else double proof it for you, um, you know, uh, that's just, again, just a fail safe way to keep yourself more marketable. So, yeah. Any other thoughts, questions, or comments? I'm going to stop sharing the PowerPoint here. Hi, I have a question. Um, one thing that I've seen on my LinkedIn, I've had a few different recruiters reach out to me. How would you suggest kind of filtering those because some of them seem a little strange or almost scam like and then some seem like they're from real professionals from real companies I was just wondering if you have any suggestions on how to sift through that that is a wonderful question yeah there's plenty of um well, to be candid, multi-level marketing schemes out there, uh, plenty of, you know, do you want to make $45,000 your first month, uh, you know, or some outlandish sort of, you know, proclamation. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, yes, I would say, and I, these numbers could be wrong, but anecdotally, one in every five emails or, me or direct messages are spam. You know what I mean? They're ones you just kind of want to delete uh, and don't re reply to. Um, the first thing I tell, to, I would have you do is um, if it's a company you haven't heard of before or you're wondering about, uh, literally the first thing I do is go out to Glassdoor or to Indeed, and there's actually, it says um, company profile, type in the name of the company and look for, look to see if it's even out there, see if it's legit. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I, I always like to look at websites. If it's a company I haven't heard of, clearly I want to see if they have a website, right? Um, and if they do, I want to see how complete and how legit the website looks um is it a shell corporation that just has like a page or two up from a wordpress site or is it like a legit corporate you know so again two things do look at glassdoor and indeed screen through there and then the other thing is um through linkedin this is powerful do a search for um people that work at and then insert the name of the company and see how many people actually work at this company that that reached out to you and then look at their profiles and you can kind of get a sense sometimes if it's stock photos, you know, um, some of it's more frankly sophisticated than I would like. Um, but you can, Glassdoor and Indeed are really powerful for screening bad actors out. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have another one here from the chat. Um, how long do you recommend experience descriptions be? 
So on, you mean under the professional experience or the professional summary? Which one? The one at the top or the one under like your internship and title? Unclear. Do you want to address both? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, professional summary statement, four, five sentences max, fairly concise. I mean, a paragraph tops, right? It doesn't need to be very long. Um, I would say once you get into your professional experience, right, that section, you should have anywhere from three to five bullet points. Um, I sometimes see people put like 10 or 12. And again, you really want to be a bit succinct and capture the most relevant ones, um, especially for the last, the latest two jobs. Most employers will look at your last one or two positions. Um, and then after that, they, they kind of trail off, you know, especially as you're in the workforce longer, I'll be honest, they care less about. So let me back up. When I deal with folks that have been out of the, been in the workplace 10, 15 years, I say I don't want your resume to go past roughly 10 years, give or take, because I'll be honest with technology and business moving as fast as it is, most employers aren't gonna look and care what you did 15 years ago, for the most part. Um, so so yeah, I'd say four bullet points-ish, five maybe for your last job or two, and then four or five sentences for the summary statement. I've got one more for you. Sure. Um, we talked a little bit about recommendations from professors, employers, coworkers. Are there specific things that you think are good for students that are just entering the workforce to have on their profiles, like skills or anything like that, that really stand out? Oh yeah, that's a fun one. Um, so here's what I'm hearing from a lot of hiring HR folks, um, that a lot, and a professor, I hear this specifically a lot. I hear, well, man, a lot of these students coming out of college have great technical skills. But something we struggle with is interpersonal skills and communication. So if you feel like you can get a good endorsement for interpersonal, I'll call it the soft skills, the stuff, you know, that is like gold right now. If you can, if you say, hey, this person is not only a great critical thinker, but man, they have, they're, they're, um, they're flexible. They have great, again, a great personality. I'll be honest, that's like, that's like mission critical right now from what I'm, what I'm hearing. So I would ask or consider people to endorse you for those kind of skill sets, because let's be honest, everyone can um, use a database. I mean, at a base level or Excel or, I mean, you know, it's like, or get on Zoom, <laughs> you know, um, those things are pretty, they're expected. Um, but the interpersonal stuff, uh, if you, if you, are a good team player, all that good jazz, you want people to endorse you for that. Yeah. Okay, I've got another one that came in here. When okay. describing the work and projects done in your internship, how do you word what you have done without giving out confidential information? So that's a good question. I just, um, so let me give you an example. So like I was working on a resume the other day uh, and uh, for a client and they're, they were in charge. They worked at a recruiting, actually a recruiting a staffing firm. And they had, um, a f they had, I'm not gonna say the company name, but it's one of the biggest in town. So that should kind of give you a clue. They were responsible for managing that relationship, which brought in like, I think $2.5 million in revenue. I mean, it was a huge account, right? So what we what I said is, is use generic language instead of saying the company name, saying uh, manage a large uh, Fortune 500 company account, right? Instead of saying company name, say Fortune 500 company. Powerfully, still powerful, but yet generic, right? Um, so you can change verbiage and syntax around like that to be more non-proprietary. Um, the other quick thing I'll just say about, about your internship experience, if there's anything you can quantify, which is sometimes hard, boy, I would ask you to consider that. Uh, filed X amount of, you know, reports a, each week. I, I'm just making that up or each month, you know, anything you can quantify at a number two is really powerful. And I'm seeing more and more HR people want stuff quantified, you know, um, so yeah, try to be generic when you need to be. Um, Cause yes, yeah, certain things are proprietary. But generally, you can find a way to kind of massage it so it still gets the point across. Like another thing is like uh, somebody asked about uh, one of my clients had a raw number that they thought was a little too direct to put out. So we used a percentage basis instead of the raw number, if that makes sense. We put it on a percentage basis, which A, it sounded better, to be honest, and B, it kept that proprietary stuff safer. 
you know. So. Okay. If you don't have a first or second connection to a person in a company where you want to work, what is a good way to reach out to connect via LinkedIn? So yeah, generally, of course, there's going to be an administrator for their page. If they have a company page, there's going to be an administrator. And normally, you could kind of connect through their company page. You know, you could even put a post saying, hey, I'd love to connect with the administrator or the HR rep for this company. So there, that's the, the one of the indirect ways or well, more direct ways, I should say, to do that. Um, the other thing is you can, even if it's a second or third level connection, it's still okay to reach out to them. It doesn't have to always be a first level connection. Um, you could just say, hey, I see your friends with XYZ, somebody you know, and then say, I would love to connect with you virtually to talk about, you know, principal or nationwide or Wells Fargo or whatever. So it's not, it doesn't always have to be a first level connection for you to ask for an informational interview. I want to strongly encourage you to, um, you know, be a little audacious. Uh, you know, don't, it doesn't always just have to be a first level connection for you to reach out. I, I generally take LinkedIn a little bit more liberally than I do like, you know, um, the other social media channels like Facebook, uh, Snapchat, Instagram, meaning, you know, like for example, Facebook, man, I, I'm not going to, take your invite unless I really am good friends with you, unless I know you, right? But with LinkedIn, I'm a little more, I don't say laissez-faire, but a little more liberal because uh, there's a lot of great people out there. And, and really, what are they going to glean if we connect? All they're going to see is what I've been doing, <laughs> you know, professionally. So there's not a lot of damage they can do per se. For undergraduate students, how much attention do you recommend they call to extracurriculars such as college athletics or clubs that they're involved in? Uh, that's a hard yes <laughs> to both that you need to call attention to it. Um, both, both are good, especially if you have like a leadership role, like you're a captain or, um, you know, manager, I don't know, uh, for like, you know, one of the teams, or if you had a leadership role on a, in a comp in a campus organization, um, you know, like we have an investments group on a grand view. And so that I, uh, I'm the advisor for, so like the president and the vice president, um, I told them, Hey, when you get your profile, make sure you say, Hey, I was, vice president of the Grandview Investment, you know, club, uh, 2020, 2019. Um, so yeah, you that's mission critical. Companies want, want active citizens. They want active young people that are, you know, I'll be honest, what I'm hearing is that they would much rather have a three, six student or a three, five student that has been active and engaged and done stuff than frankly a 4.0 student that just stayed in the library the entire time. And that's not meant to be pejorative. You should study. I get all that stuff. But I, and I say that as a professor, right? I would rather hire personally somebody that was well-rounded and still had a solid GPA, but didn't have the 4.0 that was, um, that was totally just only plugged in and didn't have to do, because frankly, it's about time management. If you're involved in the other things, I, I feel like you're a better bet to be a good time manager than someone that didn't work part-time, didn't work full-time, didn't do any extracurricular stuff. All right, last call for questions. Well, great, thank you very much. Um, sure. I do have one in here, um, wondering if we can have a copy of the slides to send to students sure. that were part of today. Awesome, great, so Absolutely. I will send that out to everybody that registered for today. So thank you very much, Ryan, for providing those. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, you should have a copy. So feel free to send it to everyone. And thanks again for your time. And uh, and if you, by the way, if you have questions or want to reach out, uh, find me on LinkedIn and or uh, Grandview. I'm either one. You, um, I'm always happy to connect virtually right now. And then hopefully sooner rather than later, <laughs> maybe back to coffee. So yeah, Jordan, thanks. And uh, everyone else said thank Taylor. Uh, happy to help. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining, Ryan. Um, for everybody else, if you are not yet part of our LinkedIn group, please find us there. And that's where the next um, webinar will be posted with the registration and information on that. So thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, happy Fourth of July week.